you know, Jay, it's almost Christmas time. And I think about my wife asking me this question. I say, you know, what do you buy a hunter? What do you buy the hunter that has everything? What do you? I would say number one on my list this year would be the Scentlock Enforcer. It's, it's a personal ozone generator. A lot of people have been asking me about it. Can I use it in my gym bag? The answer is yes. It's great for hockey players. It's great for football players. Dusty, you use them in your boots. I know some friends of mine that throw trash and put it in their truck. And you know what? It's compact, lightweight. It's about the size of an iPhone. If your phone battery is getting low, it's got a USB port on it. It's got a one-hour setting, a three-hour setting for the ozone. It's amazing, Jake. It really is. I really think this is the perfect gift because this isn't. This is kind of brand new. Like this has not been around for a very long time. Put it in your tote. You can put it in your hanging closet, and it'll clean your clothes almost as good as running it through the laundry. The point being is that this particular item is one thing that the hunter in your life doesn't have yet, and they'll thank you for it. It would be something that I would so much appreciate under my tree. You know what? It'll even fit in the stocking. Now, we talked to Tim Gothier over at Scentlock Enforcer, and he says that if you order online by December 19th, you'll receive your Scentlock Enforcer by Christmas. Or if you want to pick it up immediately, go to the Scentlock Enforcer website and check out the dealer locator. It's www.scentlockenforcer.com. Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast, powered by Scentlock Enforcer, episode number 178. Crystal Mahoney and Taylor Hans, the White Tail Widowmakers, West Monroe, Louisiana. Please support our sponsors as they make this show possible. Today's show is sponsored by the Scentlock Enforcer, the Eurohanger, and Morse's Sporting Goods. <laughs> Big Buck Registry is a virtual museum of hunting stories. We preserve a piece of Americana by interviewing and recording hunters about their hunts and experiences from across the country. And who knows, maybe we'll learn a thing or two along the way that'll help us take our hunt to the next level. Hey, this is Dean Capuano from Swarovski Optic and host of Swarovski Optic Quest. You're about to listen to another great episode of the Big Buck Registry Deer Hunting Podcast. Hi, this is Ken Jorgensen from Ruger. You're about to listen to my favorite podcast, Big Buck Registry of Deer Hunting Podcast. My name's Steve Pass, and I'm a deer hunter from Pennsylvania. And you're about to push play on my favorite deer hunting podcast, the Big Buck Registry. Hey, everybody. Happy holidays. You know, with, with the man in the red suit coming next weekend, maybe you're just asking for that big buck to make a show at your tree stand as a gift for Christmas. You know, and that, that's always a possibility and, and never give up on that, that dream of hunting. From here at the Big Buck Registry, our family to yours, happy holidays. And, you know, thank you very much for clicking the play button on the Big Buck Registry Deer Hunting Podcast. I'm your co-host, Dusty Phillips, and I am joined here with the host, Jay Scott. Jay, how are you? I'm doing quite well, my friend. I'm a little under the weather. You know, that happens sometimes this time of the year, and it seems like every holiday party I've been to in the last week or so, somehow I shook the hands or gave somebody a hug that was sniffling. And son of a gun, three days later, it, it rears its ugly head. Oh, you got to love a good airborne virus. Yeah. So, you know, I'm doing everything I can to keep my voice together for this show. Drinking water, taking some some cold meds, and uh, drinking a little lemon tea and a little honey. So, man, it's been tough. I get that that pull in the back of my throat every now and then, and it's just not, doesn't feel good at all. It's painful. Oh, you can definitely hear the frog in your voice. Yep. Yeah, I've got a frog, that's for sure. Well, I'm hoping I'll I'll get it cleared out of here uh, very shortly, and, you know, at least I won't have it during the, the holiday spin. And uh, maybe that'll be it for the season. But anyway, I thought that was kind of interesting that you said that you know maybe you can have a deer walk across your stand on Christmas. I've never done that. And, of course, we can't do that in New Hampshire. And I don't know if they've ever been able to do that in New Hampshire. We've got a deer season that closed on the 15th. So Yeah, that definitely is a, a good possibility to have that Christmas buck roll through here in Ohio. Season goes in end of February for archery. Uh, 
the 16th, 17th here, we've got uh, Ohio Shotgun, Season 2 Day Shotgun, and best of luck to all the Ohio hunters out there that tune into the podcast. And then uh, we got Late Season Muzzler coming up in January. And uh, yeah, we still got time. There's still time in Ohio. The, the weather conditions are definitely uh, in the prime. We're seeing some, some single-digit numbers, you know. We rolled out of the house on... Wednesday last week and uh, negative three on my way into work and uh, supposed to stay cold and here on Saturday it's supposed to be 50 the, the temperature is going to rise it should be like that one last what do they call that the Indian summer for for right right for Indian. the fall it's kind of weird we're going to hit 50 then Sunday tomorrow is going to roll into some 20 degree temperatures again and looks like it's going to stay pretty cold for the next week or two and then you know continuing to be in cold temperatures from here on out you know Ohio season the, the ruts obviously settled down focus on a food source a late season food source and if you can get on a food and, and know where the deer are eating at that's something that could uh, change your whole late season deer hunt that's very very interesting that you're seeing such highs and lows and, and you guys got your first snowfall uh, this past week so yeah, it's just been a real funky uh, fall into winter. It's it's just I don't know. It's it's a weird. It's probably one of the weirdest ones I re- I can recall as far as you know. Here we had the rut kick in. We was having seventy degree temperatures, and that just is unseasonable like you know highs. And it it was it was one of the most weirdest ruts I've ever experienced. Out the 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 major activity we've seen this year on trail camera was like October twenty first, twenty second, twenty third. Right. It was unbelievable how much deer activity was, you know, in the woods all three of them days. And a lot of people capitalized on that uh, and, and really killed a nice buck. And, you know, a lot of bucks were, were harvested that those few days. And then, you know, the rut come around November, you know, 11th, 12th, into the 15th, 20th. And it, it just really nocturnal. And it, it was just one of them weird, weird years where the daylight rut. Some, some people said it was really, really hot. In, in places and other people was like, man, I, I haven't really seen no signs of the rut. Huh. Other than scrapes and rubs, you know. And in my area, I, I never seen one buck chasing uh, while I was hunting. But that, you know, that's something that just one of them odd years and different areas where, where things were happening different. It was, it was crazy. Well, we have a, a great lineup, as we always do. We always try to bring the best of the best, brightest and, and best deer hunters from across the country that show up on our show to tell us how they do it so you can do it too. And uh, before we get into this week's guest, I wanted to read a letter that we got from a fan. And this is from Gordon Stevens. And Gordon writes, Jay and Dusty, I just want to say thank you to both of you for your help with getting my first public land buck this year during gun season in New York State. I passed on a number of smaller bucks on private land during the seek chase rut period and even a debatable shooter for me on Thanksgiving Day. I had what was my biggest buck show up today on public land and it has been highly pressured. I followed advice I have learned while listening to your podcast to get this one in the freezer. I learned the most from the Dave Pribby podcast and I really enjoyed the podcast with John Stallone. I got this buck on the ground using an active still hunt to stalk and ambush. I have enjoyed the podcast and they have helped me with a number of buck doe encounters over the past two years while bow hunting. Thanks for the good work you do. I'm going to contact my rod and gun club and try to give away my extra safety harnesses too. You set a great example for us all. Keep doing what you're doing. P.S. The suggestion. Please put a link to the tabs on your website of all of your sponsors. I want to get a Euro hanger for my buck, but I'm having a difficulty getting to the one mentioned in your podcast. Sincerely, Gordon Stevens, Casanova, New York. That was pretty cool. Thank you, Gordon, for your your letter. Um, if you want a Euro hanger, uh, and I know we don't have the links to all of our sponsors on our webpage, but there's a reason for that. They we have different packages available for different levels of sponsorship. Some of which include links to the to the product on our website. But always, always, always in the show notes, you will find links directly to. The, the link that that sponsor wants to use. And for the Eurohanger, it's facebook.com forward slash Eurohanger. And that's pretty straightforward. And it's E-U-R-O-H-A-N-G-E-R. So facebook.com forward slash E-U-R-O-H-A-N-G-E-R. Also, you can order the Eurohanger on eBay. 
You just go to the search bar on eBay and type in Euro Hanger. That's right. Yep. So there's multiple ways to get it. Great little unit. Great for Christmas if you're still looking for uh, those things that, you know, the hunter who has everything. This is probably one of those things that he's never had before. And it's great for Euro mounts. Um, man, you've got them dusty. I was watching a little tutorial that Jim Snow was doing the other day. And sometimes you have those bucks that have the antlers that grow straight back a little bit. And it, it could bump into the wall. All you got to do is take a... If you're strong enough with your finger and push it down just a little bit, and those things are solid. I mean, they're they're rugged, so you got to be pretty strong to bend it with your thumb. But if you can't do that, you can use some crescent wrench or something like that. Yeah, the Euro hanger. Uh, I've actually got two of them right here in the studio, the podcast studio, and I love them. Uh, they got my. They got uh, one of them's got a 164 inch whitetail on. The other one's got about a 150, 155 inch whitetail on it, and and. Uh, I hang on the wall where the door is at on one side, and I've slammed the door coming in and out. Not you know, not tremendously hard, but I've shut it pretty hard. And and uh, you know, day in day out, the Euro hanger is right there hanging my deer heads right here in the studio. Nice. And uh, another shout out to Mike. Uh, Mike uh, sent me a, a Facebook message saying that uh, he had just bought a tree stand and uh, he wanted to donate the uh, safety harness that come with it. Mike's going to send me the safety harness in the mail and I'll have one ready to go to get it out in the hands for somebody in need. That is beautiful. Our project is still underway. We're still getting requests daily from people who want or need safety harnesses who either didn't never bought them, couldn't afford them, but we're trying to get more people to use them. So if you want one, send uh, an email to Jay or Dusty or Jim at BigBuckRegistry.com. If you have them to donate, we'll be kind of the collection center. We'll redistribute the good ones that are have not expired preferably still in the package and usually the ones that come with the the stands uh these days will with those are the ones we're looking for um you can uh shoot us same thing shoot us an email if you have some you'd like to donate them jay or jim or dusty at bigbuckregistry.com speaking of that dusty our guest this week is crystal mahoney and taylor hans and they're out of louisiana and they're they're donating to the the project that we have going on with the safety harnesses and crystal and taylor reside in Louisiana. They weren't always there, but they actually live in the same town that the folks from Duck Dynasty live in. I think it's Monroe, Louisiana. And yes, they do see each other at some breakfast spots on occasion, and they hunt some of the same lands that those guys do. We're going to learn all about hunting in Louisiana. What's it like down there? And, you know, it's a a foreign land to us. I don't really know how how to go even go about hunting Louisiana, but we're going to learn all about it. And they've got a pretty good thing going on 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 youtube and facebook and it's one of the reasons that i was attracted to this couple is that they they kind of have this matter of fact very down to earth way about how they do tutorials like for example they were looking at a tree stand and they were showing you how to assemble it and all the features of it without really promoting it was just kind of like a hey this is what it is this is how it works so if you're interested here it is but th- this is these are the things that we just don't see on YouTube, the, the, the basic stuff. And it was really nice to see that they were genuine about it. It's kind of cool. So we reached out to them. We're going to talk to them about deer hunting as a couple down in Louisiana. Uh, but before we do, let's turn to Jim Keller with the deer news. For the Big Buck Registry, this is Jim Keller with the deer news. Our first story this week, how effective are deer whistles to avoid vehicle collisions? This story was featured on the deer and deerhunting.com website and was written by John Ozaga. Invented in Austria in 1979, deer whistles are still distributed by many companies in Europe and the United States. Simple, air-activated whistles are relatively inexpensive at $5 to $10 a piece online, but electronic systems may cost several hundred dollars. The devices are generally attached to the front of the vehicle, and manufacturers claim they produce an ultrasonic frequency and warn animals of approaching vehicles, thereby reducing deer vehicle collisions. Early tests conducted in Finland indicated that canids, bear, deer, and elk heard sounds emitted by the whistles because their ears moved. However, other investigators found the testing procedures were faulty. In Utah, researchers Laura Rahman and Larry Dalton detected no differences in responses from 150 groups of free-ranging mule deer to vehicles equipped with and without the deer whistles. Although some deer ran away from the test vehicle, they did so regardless of the presence or absence of whistles. A recent review of deer whistle effectiveness by University of Georgia researchers led by Sharon Vlitsky came to similar negative conclusions. Previous research on vehicle-mounted auditory deterrence was 
confounded by use of commercially produced devices lacking proper function and sufficient sound intensity to be audible to deer in roadway conditions. In other words, some commercially available deer whistles do not produce sound of ultrasonic frequency as claimed. In fact, some emit no sound at all under normal operating conditions. Harlem deer is captured and will be killed. This article was featured in the New York Times website and was written by Andy Newman. A deer that had been living in a park in Harlem was captured by the police early Thursday after wandering onto a lawn at a nearby housing complex, and he will be killed, a spokeswoman for Mayor Bill de Blasio said. The deer, a white-tailed buck with one antler, is now at the city animal shelter in East Harlem. He will be put to death because state regulations prohibit relocating deer except for scientific purposes, and New York City does not intend to release the deer back into Manhattan. The buck had stayed within a narrow, rocky, 10-block-long strip of woods inside the park, but in the early hours of Thursday, he visited the Polo Grounds Towers public housing complex just north of the park. Police tranquilized and captured the deer after learning it was trapped within a fenced-off area in a residential development and posing a risk to public safety. The deer had been fed a steady stream of carrots, apples, and other treats by visitors, despite rules against feeding wildlife in the city, and had grown fairly tame. The deer's admirers might have inadvertently contributed to its plight. Causes of Early Antler Casting This story was originally posted on the QDMA website and was reported by Kip Adams. Every year, starting in December, QDMA begins to receive sporadic reports of bucks dropping their antlers earlier than normal. These reports seem to be more common in some years or more concentrated in specific regions, and sometimes hunting season is still open when these reports occur. It's unpleasant to think that you might mistake an early shedding buck for a doe and shoot him while trying to meet your target doe harvest. This is another reason, another good reason, to fill your doe quota early in the season. Antler growth, mineralization, and casting, or dropping antlers, is largely controlled by hormones and regulated by photoperiod, the amount of light per day. According to acclaimed antler expert Dr. George Bubenik of the University of Gulf in Ontario, the testosterone levels causing antler casting appear to be very close to the same levels responsible for velvet shedding. In isolated incidences of early antler shedding, the bucks involved were probably injured during fall and cast their antlers early as a result. In situations where numerous bucks are involved or where bucks across several square miles cast their antlers early, nutritional stress, physical exhaustion from the rut, or a combination of the two are likely responsible. Nutritional stress can easily be confirmed or ruled out by assessing body weights, lactation status, and or kidney fat percentages from the doju harvest. This is one more reason to collect harvest data from every deer taken on the property you hunt and or manage. About the only bright side to early antler casting is it allows you to find sheds a little sooner. Hunters seeing fewer deer in Virginia. This story was originally reported on the Roanoke Times website as reported by Bill Cochran. Virginia's deer kill thus far is estimated to be down 12% compared to the same time last season. Many hunters report that they just aren't seeing as many deer as in the past. It is much the same in other states. West Virginia reported a 25% decline in its two-week buck season. Getting the blame is a large acorn crop that is said to be keeping deer scattered in the woods, unfavorable hunting weather, a lower number of hunters, and fewer deer. Add to that is the presence of EHD. EHD cut into the 2014 deer kill, which was off 21%. We will not know the final deer kill numbers until early February, but I have a sneaking suspicion it, the problem, might be EHD again, said Matt Knox, deer project leader for the Department of Game and Inland Fisheries. We will watch for an update on this story. That concludes this week's edition of the Big Buck Registry's Deer News. For links to the stories featured this week, please check our show notes at www.bigbuckregistry.com. If you have ideas for future topics or have any questions about any of these topics, please email me at jim at bigbuckregistry.com. For the Big Buck Registry, this is Jim Keller with the Deer News. Thanks to Jim Keller for the Deer News. Without further ado, here's Crystal and Taylor. Taylor Hans, Crystal Mahoney, welcome to the Big Buck Registry Deer Hunting Podcast. How are you, my friends? Doing good. How are you, Jay? I'm doing real well. Hey, Jay. How are you? Uh, hi, Crystal. Great to have you guys on the show. It's uh, we, we talked about doing this a little while back, and you know, we I, I dig what you've got going on. You know, as, as the world has gotten smaller due to Facebook, we get to see what everybody's up to, and you guys, uh, you're into some cool stuff down there in Louisiana. And anytime somebody shows up on my Facebook feed wearing uh, face paint, I'm like, oh, well, who's this? And that's exactly what happened, you know. So, 
Um, I'm pretty psyched <laughs> to talk to you guys and, and learn a little bit about life in Louisiana and deer hunting life in Louisiana. Definitely. Well, we're ready to uh, let y'all have a peek under the tent. <laughs> All right. <laughs> now, where, whereabouts in Louisiana are you? We're actually in uh, North Louisiana. It's West Monroe, Louisiana. Uh, used to, uh, you'd have to probably reference somebody to say uh, we're uh, so many miles outside of Shreveport, but now after the Duck Dynasty craze, I think West Monroe is pretty uh, well known across the, the United States. So that is actually where we are. We're in the same town as the Duck Dynasty show. Gotcha. You're in the same town. <laughs> that the Robertsons hang out in. So this is like, you know, those guys have gotten so large. Uh, you, 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 they, if you go to any, any convention, they are the headliner. Like there's nobody bigger than these guys. They've, I can't think of any outdoor outfit that's really done bigger things on television than those guys. Now, I don't know them personally. I don't know if you know them personally, but I'd say they're, they're probably as far as, you know, following, they're probably, that's about as big as it gets. And you, oh, they're yeah. absolutely huge. And the craziest part about it is we, we are like, we're from such a small town. So, I mean, you would think that everybody knows everybody, but everybody doesn't really know everybody. Um, I have gotten to meet these guys a few times. And since it is a small town, like we eat at the same places. Um, I think I was having lunch with some clients uh, last week and uh, the whole family was in there, you know, having lunch and we're sitting tables across from each other. And then, I've had to catch a plane and, you know, I mean, Willie just flies like the rest of us, you know, and we hop on the same plane and say right. hello. And I actually I work for a local um, office supply company and we actually, you know, provide their office supplies for them for a while. So we've <laughs> actually done business with them as well. So gotcha. it's a small town, you know, we're, we're not all, we're not all best friends or anything, but you definitely see faces you know, around the town, right. but they're, they're super nice down to earth people. They really are. are. Are most of the people in Monroe down to earth? Yeah, it really is. Everybody is pretty family oriented and it, it's so great because it's, I'm so glad I got into hunting because anyone that you talk to around here, like you can strike up a conversation about hunting and you have like a common ground with basically anybody, whether you see them at Walmart or, you know, a restaurant or out at the movies, you know, just standing in line waiting to buy a movie ticket. Like everybody is just really down to earth and friendly and, you know, everybody has manners and we all say yes, ma'am and no, sir. and hmm. You know, if you see somebody in need, everybody tries to help everybody else out. So it's it's very friendly, just small hometown. That's very cool. Uh, did, did you both grow up in that area? Actually, we're both from Texas. Um, I lived, I was born in Houston, and I lived there until I was about 10. Um, you know, and I actually don't come from a hunting family or a hunting background. I think the extent of my hunting when I was little was um, my grandfather telling me that we were going to go hunting. We had this clock. It was like a clock weather radar type thing. And depending on the temperature, uh, it said you were going fishing, you were going golfing, you were going hunting. Um, and it landed on hunting a lot. <laughs> I remember that. I remember that. Gotcha. You know what I'm talking about? Yes. I guess it's not yeah. really a clock. It's, you know, like a weather reader. But, right, yeah. Um, yeah, my grandparents, they actually lived right outside of Houston, this little town called Montgomery, Texas. And so I remember just being at their house and I'd wake up, you know, early in the morning. And I'd run out there and I'm like, oh, we're hunting today. And so we would like go walk up and down the dirt road by their house and there's, you know, trees. And my idea of hunting was going out there, finding a frog and putting it into to the swimming pool that we named Crystal's Frog Pond. So... <laughs> that was there was never actually gotcha. any hunting going on. <laughs> it was more like catch a lizard and and there you go, you hunted. So, um, but I grew up there until I was about ten, um, and then we moved over here from Houston to West Monroe, Louisiana, and been here ever since. I am actually I was born in uh, Dallas, Texas. Uh, I was born there. It's a crazy story. My mother and my father are both from Monroe, Louisiana. And they did not know each other at all and happened to uh, move off to Dallas. And um, crazy enough, they met in Dallas after not knowing each other in Monroe and uh, got together. And I was born in Dallas and I lived there till I was, uh, I believe, about seven. And then we moved to Monroe and I've been um, I've been in Monroe ever since or 
I guess we bounced around between West Monroe and Monroe, which they're just separated by a little bridge. They're they're pretty much the same town. Total opposite of you know way she grew up. My my I grew up. Our family was all about hunting. Everybody in our family hunted from the time I was a little boy to to now. I mean it's Thanksgivings. It was one of those deals where you know holidays revolved around hunting. Everybody knew that you know nobody was coming in until after everybody was done hunting, and everybody was going to leave early and go hunting. You know, it's just been part of my family since I was a little boy. I, I love it here, and you know, like like I said, I've I've been here ever since I I grew up. Uh, I went to high school here. It is a neat town. She was talking about you know how it's you know the small town and it's 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 the perfect size because it doesn't have that extreme small feel to where. Uh, you know everybody but at the same time you know it is a a small town to where you know you have that you know just that small town feel sure that's 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 uh i think that's important and makes life a little easier uh if you have that small town feel we both went to west Monroe high school you know graduated from there and then i graduated from ulm and i'm a little bit older than taylor i guess he likes some older i, I like them young what can i say gotcha. so taylor had a big crush on you <laughs> when you when you were a senior and he was in junior high is what you're saying. Uh, actually, Something really weird and awkward like that. Yeah. Not, now it's not so weird, but back then it was weird. Yeah. 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 Gotcha. So what what was uh, what was Taylor like back then, Crystal? Mm, I didn't know him when he was actually in junior high, but um, he he has grown up so much. We've actually we've been together <laughs> for five years now. <laughs> yeah growing up from junior high no we've been together for five years now um i was already out of college when we met um but even just in you know in the five years we've been together like he's just blossomed into you know just a man just a, a real man like i guess we all have those stages in life where like we go from you know not knowing to knowing type right. thing right. and uh it's been such a cool experience like we've both grown together you know throughout our careers and throughout, you know, I have an eight year old little boy. So just for, you know, and he doesn't have any children. So for him just to, to learn what it is to step into that role of like, you know, parenthood or step dadhood or whatever you want to call it is, was something new. And like, <laughs> it was sure. so awkward at first. Cause he's like, Oh my God, a kid, what do you do? You know? And my son was like two at the time or you no, know, just, I guess just turned three ish or something. Right. And, uh, he didn't know what to do with kids. And now, I mean, they're just like best buds like they laugh all the time and like he helps him with his homework and it's just it's it's really great like we we have a great relationship gotcha so taylor what was crystal like in high school actually it was crazy story because we hung out with some of the same people but we did uh, we didn't actually know each other um at that time during that age i guess just like a lot of young people do you know made some 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 poor mistakes but you know it's it's been neat to grow together and, you know, it's been neat to grow up. So what's your earliest recollection of a deer hunting when you were a kid? Man, that's crazy. We've been talking, it's like we've been talking about life stuff. I forgot, I almost forgot we were talking about right? it's a deer hunt podcast. That's right. <laughs> uh, oh yeah. This is deer hunting. I know. This is about yeah. deer hunting. My earliest uh, <laughs> recollection of deer hunting would probably be with my dad. The earliest memory, I guess, of a hunt I have is me and him sitting in the stand and we were sitting there and I just remember being really bored and really cold and knowing that I wasn't going to get an opportunity to shoot. And I remember sitting there and the deer came out and I guess I was, man, I had to have been probably about six years old at the time. And the deer came out and you know, I was looking at the deer and my dad offered me up the, the opportunity to shoot. And I'm, I was blown away. And I just remember pulling the, getting the scope up to my eye and trying to see the deer and I couldn't find the deer in the scope like for the life of me like it was a doe and I could not find the deer in the scope for the life of me and I pull my head away and I'd see the deer in the lane which clears day and then I turn back and the deer wouldn't be there and uh after you know fumbling around with that and I'm sure being really loud uh the deer stepped off and I remember just that um I remember that feeling, it was that, that let down feeling, that heartache feeling of not getting to, to seal the deal and, you know, kind of feeling like you let your dad down. Uh, but at the same time, it, it, it fueled this weird fire in me. It was, it, it, it turned, I remember at that point, you know, hunting, like I said before, I was cold and I was bored and I was tired. And I remember at that point though, everything changed, you know, it became, you know, at that point I, I really wanted to kill a deer then. I really wanted to actually become a hunter. Um, and hunting started not being as boring and, uh, 
you know, I started actually trying to learn and I started listening and, you know, it was, it became something that I really, uh, I really enjoyed and I still do today. So Very cool. Crystal, what about you? My earliest memory of like falling in love with the outdoors really is, you know, going out there with my grandfather and looking and saying, okay, we're going fishing today or okay, we're going hunting today. And even though it wasn't, you know, actual hunting with a gun or not even, you know, a bow or anything like that, like we would go out there. I remember on fishing days, um, and we would fish and sometimes like we wouldn't even have bait or anything. We would just go and like drop the line with the hook in and it would be right there, like at the shallow end of the the pond and like the little baby fish would bite on and I'd put them in my bucket and then we'd go back and he you know I had this little above ground pool that they did for me with this little sign that said crystal's frog pond and I would put the fish and the frogs in there um and they would swim around with me all day and then at night you know my grandfather would go and fish them out and go dump them back in the pond gotcha. so I would you know I just loved being out outside and outdoors and everything my first actual hunting experience was with Taylor. Taylor's actually the one that, that introduced me to it and I fell in love with it. Um, it's one of those, it's one of those moments where I was kind of like, there's no way it's this easy, you know, cause I hear the deer stories and I, you know, I'd seen him going out and he would hunt like, you know, 15 hunts at a time and not come home with anything. And I'm thinking, you know, what are you out there in the woods doing? So we, uh, and now I know, you know, you're actually hunting. Sometimes you don't see anything here in Louisiana, especially with this heat. But my first hunt with him, we, um, we went out to, um, his dad's land and, uh, we carry, you know, carried a gun in and get up there in the box stand and it's nice and it's not too hot and it's not too cold. And we had been sitting there for maybe, maybe an hour, you know, we, we, I guess he wanted to make sure that I didn't get burnt out or hate it my first time because he loved it so much. So he was like going easy on me. Um, and so we sat there for maybe an hour and the sun started going down and deer started coming out and I was like, Oh my gosh, so cool. And, you know, he walked me through like what to do, like put the gun here and yeah, point it like this. And can you see, and like, he's adjusting it for me and doing everything. And, um, and I laid her down, you know, it, it was, it was a shot laid her down. She's a big old doe. Um, and I just, you know, I fell in love. I would just the excitement and, and the deer coming out and being able to see that and do that. But like, I felt like there was something more, like I was missing, like I liked it, but you know, I, I'd heard stories about him, you know, harvesting deer with his bow. And like, it, it just sounded like such a completely different experience that, when I got my first deer, you know, and I, I was already like hooked in, I was like, all right, let's get me a bow. And, uh, hadn't looked back since, like I've been an avid, just fall in love with, you know, bow hunting ever since, ever since he took me out there and, and let me shoot my first deer. Nice. Oh, that's very cool. Yeah. Very cool. So Crystal, what's your philosophy on hunting? Like what's, how do you view the world around, about hunting? It's as a, as a conservationist, what's your view on that? Well, Um, I feel like, how do I put it? Um, I love the people that I've met that hunt. I love the, the feel of it. I love getting out there in the mornings when the rest of the world is still completely asleep. Um, and, and and getting out there and being quiet and getting dressed and and getting into the woods and getting into the stand and, and not a single creature knowing that I'm there, you know, and being able to just sit out there and watch the world come alive. Like I didn't realize like that feeling, I I don't, I can't really explain the feeling, but considering, you know, the, the audience that I'm talking to, I don't really have to explain it. Y'all know what I mean. Right. Just that, that feeling of sitting there watching the, the woods come alive and hearing the woods come alive. I'm harvesting food for my family that hasn't been pumped full of steroids, that hasn't been, you know, cooped up in these cages and, and abused and overpopulated and all this other stuff that these deer have lived long, full lives. And I'm going to, you know, I, I, I'm a really good shot with my bow. So I know that I'm going to have a good shot, have a clean kill. They're not going to suffer. Um, and I'm going to be able to provide food for my family, not only for my family, but we also have friends that don't hunt. Like I have a friend that, that I worked with. She, she used to hunt when she was younger with her family and stuff. And now she's kind of estranged from her family and she has a husband and the husband doesn't hunt. Actually got to provide food for them, you know, and, and so she gets to feed her kids and do what we enjoy and what we love to do and, and harvest. You know, I also think that, 
you know, going out and hunting. I mean, that's a right that we have. That's a, a something that, that does help the environment and, and help, you know, conserve deer. Like you don't want this overpopulation of deer running around. I think I heard a story recently about um, something about deer in California and somebody was like, well, if they'd let us come over there and shoot more of them or something like that. And it kind of made me giggle. Um, but no, like I absolutely love hunting. First and foremost to me, hunting is something that I can do no matter what's going on in my life, no matter, um, you know, whether I've got stress on my mind or whether I'm celebrating something or no matter what, uh, the woods is, um, it's a great place to be. It's a, it's a place that I can escape, but it's also a place that I can go and I can celebrate and I can, I can enjoy myself. It's a, it's a fix all, um, it's a one-stop fix all. And, uh, you know, that's, that's definitely one of the things that I love the most about hunting is just the ability to go and to get away and kind of like she said, just just to experience the world. You know, I, I had so many different things um, that you get to experience out there and just that you just uh, get to appreciate when you're out there. Um, but it also means to me, you know, it's it's a it's a camaraderie thing. You know, I I, I, mm-hmm. I enjoy uh, the social aspect of hunting as well. You know, I, I grew up, you know, hunting, like I said, hunting with my family and um, you know, I, both of my brothers killed their very first deer with me. Um, her, her son killed his first deer with me last year. Um, you know, it's a place that you get to share things with people, you know, that you get to, you get to really, um, spend quality time with other people. It's just you, um, and that person and, you know, in, 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 in the woods and, and whatever game you're after. And, uh, you know, but also, like she said, you know, it's the conservation as you know, part of it, you know, it's, um, you know, there's so many, there's, it, there's just so many other things. Like she was talking about the, you know, the steroids pump full of, you know, the animals and stuff like that. Like I get to go out and I get to harvest something, um, that I know a hundred percent, you know, where it came from and, you know, how it's going to be processed. And, you know, I'm, I get to watch that animal in the wild and I also get, to, you know, I get to take it straight from the field to dinner. And, you know, that's a, that's a really neat feeling. And, uh, I don't know, man, it, you know, it's, it's a, it's a support thing too. You know, I think that hunters, um, get caught up a lot and, you know, this deer or that deer, or, um, you know, you should have let that deer walk or you should have, you know, um, given that deer one more year or he wasn't quite big enough or, you know, just whatever. And, you know, we need to just all support each other. And that's what I try to do. And, um, you know, that's what we try to do over here. You know, we try to just support everybody because, you know, you don't have any clue, what that next man might be going through as he's hunting that might be you know he might have a place and he might not get to break away from his family or his work but maybe once or twice a year and he might not see but one or two deer and that might be his opportunity to take that deer and that might be a trophy to him no matter what that deer might be or it might be someone who's trying to feed his family and that deer that steps out or whatever game it is that they're hunting um might be how he provides for his family you know during the winter and you know that's that's what hunting is all about to me. And, uh, you know, we have a, we have a Facebook page that me and Crystal started. It's called Whitetail Widowmakers. And we put a post on there the other day. <clears throat> it was actually a friend of ours and we had some extra deer meat and we gave it to them and they posted a picture, um, of them actually cooking the deer meat. And it was the father and the son and they were spending some time together, you know, and they were, they were flouring the, the, uh, the deer steak and they were getting ready to fry it. And like, you could just see the smiles and the laughter and like, you know, just enjoyment and like, that's what this is all about. You know, that getting to spend time with each other, getting to, uh, you know, give back and just, you know, that unity, like I was talking about. And it's just, that's what hunting's all about to me. Yeah. That's what it, that's, that's what it means. That's that you're absolutely right. That's what it means. There's so much good that comes from it. it it's, it's mind boggling. And when you, you bump into these anti hunters that, say it's the worst thing on the planet it, it it you just can't even wrap your head around where they're coming from it doesn't make any sense because clearly they've never experienced this so and i think when they do it's a whole other ball game we've seen that uh firsthand with some of our guests we actually have interviewed people that were once antis who are now deer hunters and they they can't understand how they were there either so well i think i think also if you talk about kind of what you're talking about the conservation aspect of it if you get down and you do your research and see you know the benefit that hunting actually takes that it, that it creates as far as the herd and uh right. the infection and the disease between the herd and um 
you know, overpopulation areas and where hunting helps out, you know, as far as like just all different aspects of, of the, you know, the cycle of life with as far as the deer goes. And, you know, it's just, if you just sit down and do your research, you see that, you know, the anti-hunting is not, is not the way to go. And it's, you know, it doesn't, as long as you're doing it right and you're doing it ethical and you're doing it legal, um, you know, hunting is an incredible way of life and it provides so many more things than just a, you know, a picture of a trophy or a kill or something like that. Like it's so such a, a deeper and more uh, meaningful experience. Right. Right. Exactly. I'm going to turn the mic over to Dusty Phillips here and we're going to hopefully learn all about deer hunting in Louisiana. I want to know everything there is to know that you can share with us about how you go about it, what your strategies, your techniques, uh, the stuff you're using, what you put in your backpack when you go in the woods, uh, what's the terrain like, what are your challenges that, that are, are there that uh, make it maybe harder than where it is in the rest of the country, what it, what it uh, seems to be harder there for you or easier, I don't know. Uh, but I want, I'm going to turn it over to Dusty and let's, uh, let's go on a little journey in Louisiana, Dusty. Yeah, let's do that. And, uh, Boy, where to start Louisiana hunting at? Wow, let's run in, run through our, our our gear list here and kind of get a reference to uh, wrap our heads around what what kind of gear you guys are using in Louisiana down there. Tell us a little bit about uh, what bow you're shooting, Crystal. I'll start with you. Okay. Uh, well, when I I first started this thing, you know, Taylor introduced me to it, and he is a Matthews man all the way. So, um, God, I think. Taylor, I think you've been through three Matthews bows since we started, and I just started hunting like three years ago. It's ridiculous. Um, But I personally shoot a Matthews Chill SDX. Um, I love it. It it shoots well. Um, I think I pull about uh, 45 pounds. Um, I shoot slick tricks right now. I'm actually thinking about swapping broadheads just, um, just for the simple fact that, you know, I don't pull that much weight. So I kind of need something that's going to give me a little bit more of a um, a blood trail because, you know, I've had the last two, but we're actually looking into um, switching me broadheads right now. And uh, I shoot gold tip arrows. And um, as far as like my shooting, you know, my bow, that's, that's kind of how I'm rigged out. Gotcha. Any I particular you arrows you're shooting with that bow? Oh yeah. I shoot the gold tip arrows. What kind of broadheads you tip them with? The um, slip tricks. Gotcha. Taylor, let's get into your bow setup. I shoot a Matthews Halon. Uh, I shoot the six inch brace height. I'm shooting uh, gold tip uh, kinetic pierce platinum arrows. And I also, uh, I shoot the slick trick broadheads as well. Um, like she said, I've, I've always been a Matthews guy. Uh, my first ever bow was actually a PSE. My dad uh, bought me a PSE Nova when I was 12 years old and I shot it for a while and um, he had a, an old Matthews Q2 and when he upgraded, he gave me his and I shot that for a while. And then I've shot a switchback. I've shot Outback. I've shot a Z7. um, And then now I'm on the Halon and man, I'm telling you what, I I love that bow. It, uh, I keep it very well protected and taken care of. It is, it's my baby. That sounds like, yeah, for sure. He's yeah, given like cool. dimensions and stuff. Right. <laughs> Way more knowledgeable. Right. Just uh, shoot a bigger buck than him and you don't have to worry about all that. Right. I know. <laughs> like, I may not know what exactly this is called, but look what it did. <laughs> right. There you go. No, I'm just kidding. Here's a trophy in our eyes. Do you guys, carry a, do you guys carry a backpack to the tree stand? Oh, yes. How about yeah, you, Taylor? We do. We do. Okay. What any particular brand? Crystal, we'll start with you. I'm going to break this down like a question for each of you. So just bear with us. Yeah, sure. Um, I have actually, I found this cheap little backpack that has, I'm obsessed with pockets and it has the perfect amount of pockets and I put, I, it, I can put everything where I want it. It was 20 bucks at Walmart. <laughs> it's awesome. Um, in my back, do you want to know what's in my backpack? Absolutely. It's, it's, it's very, very interesting. I make sure that I definitely, um, have my water bottle because I've been out there and forgotten my water bottle and that's pretty miserable all day. So I have my water bottle in one of the side pockets. I keep a thermosil in the other side pocket with refills, um, in it because in Louisiana, oh my gosh, if you don't have a thermosil, like be prepared. It doesn't matter if it's summer, if it's winter, if it's spring, I say it as if we have seasons here in Louisiana. It's just hot all the time. 
Um, so there are always mosquitoes. So have to have to stick with the thermosil. Um, I keep three different hats in my bag <laughs> because I never know which one I'm going to be in the mood for. I have one um, that's really special to me. Taylor's grandfather actually passed away um, a year before he and I met, or it might have been six months. It was pretty recent before he and I met, so I never actually got to meet him. But I've heard so many stories and, you know, how he was such an influential part in, like, Taylor's um, hunting career growing up and just, like, in his life in general. And he was just such a big figure in their family in general that um, when we were going through some stuff and, you know, we were trying to get me outfitted to go on the first hunt, Taylor had run across that and he gave it to me. And, like, I've, it was his grandfather's hunting hat, and it was just a an old um, mossy oak. Uh, hat that has the little face mask like attached to it Um, and I've just you know that's that's probably like one of my like most treasured things that I have like in my hunting arsenal would probably be that hat but I have that hat and then I keep a black um, a black wind pro hat in my bag for whenever I hunt um, hunt like in a blind if we're gonna if I'm gonna do my little ground attack in the blind so I have my black hat in there and then I also keep um, another camo hat in there as well. And then what else do I have in my bag? I keep an extra release because, you know, I'm clumsy and, and I have had it happen where I'm pulling my bow up in the tree and I get it up and I go to put my release on and I drop it on the ground. And it's like, well, <laughs> do I climb back down or, oh, wait. So I keep an extra one in the bag. That was my nice little trick that Taylor taught me. Um, I have my rangefinder in my bag. I have my binoculars in my bag. I have zip ties in my bag. Keep my hunting license in there at all times. Um, probably have six different flashlights because you never know. Um, and then what else? Oh, I have my headlamp and my oh, deer drag. You sure this ain't like a semi trailer you're dragging out there with you? <laughs> right. I know. Well, I'm a woman and I keep like a kitchen sink in my purse. So I gotta have like you. a kitchen sink in my backpack. <laughs> <laughs> you got her. All right, Taylor, your turn. What kind of backpack are you packing? I actually have a scent lock backpack. Um, I bought it last year. Um, it's, I like it because it has the, it's got a pretty bulky uh, buckle that goes across my stomach and it keeps it pretty uh, stable and gives me some extra buckles. And it's got lots of attachments to it uh, to where I can clip things on. Um, and just all around, I just, I like uh, most of the stuff that Scentlock puts out. Uh, you know, I just, they put out a quality product and that's the one I went with. Um, now, as far as what's in my backpack, uh, man, I'm like borderline survivalist, I guess. I, I have everything. If I, I guess when I'm packing up my backpack, when I get a new one, I think of every scenario that could go wrong or every scenario that I might need something and I find a way to get it in there. Uh, um, binoculars. Um, I've got my range finder. Um, I've got multiple flashlights, um, an extra, um, it's like a, a battery boost for my cell phone, a tree saw, uh, a couple knives. Like she said, the thermosil, that is definitely a must. We're still fighting mosquitoes here in Louisiana, so that's always fun. Really, I, I, I try to keep just about everything that I can in there uh, just for any situation. I keep an extra release. In hunting, just I'm sure, just like everybody that's listening and, and y'all as well, um, anything that can go wrong has gone wrong, and the best best way to learn from something is to make a mistake. And you know, it, as far as I've learned, and I've made tons of them. So every time I make one, I make a little mental note, or every time I forget something, I try to make a little mental note, and I find a place for it in my backpack, and it seems to have worked out well. So very good, West Monroe, Louisiana. Let's talk about camouflage. What kind of camouflage are you guys wearing down there? I prefer uh, real tree. Um, like I said, I, I try to wear uh, any lots of scent lock stuff. I have, own a lot of Under Armour that I like to wear. They make a good, you know, a good product. Uh, you know, I strictly bow hunt, so I'm I, I really like uh, layers. So instead of something real big and bulky, I like for it to be more form fitting and um, layer up. So you know, the Under Armour stuff, the more form fitting and the base layers uh, seem to work well, but I guess Realtree would be my go-to as far as camouflage goes. Gotcha. Crystal, how about yeah, you? Real, yeah, Realtree is definitely my my go-to on that. I do have that one mossy oak hat. But yeah, Realtree pattern just seems to kind of kind of fit in with the, the scenery that we've got down here. And 
I'm with Taylor. Like I, I like to layer up. I'm absolutely obsessed with um, my base layers from Cabela's. Like I, you know, he Taylor's an Under Armour guy. So when we went to get me my first pair of base layers, he's like, "Oh, get these Under Armors. They're so great and wonderful." And of course, you know, I'm like trying to wound up or think of anything else. And so like we're, we're we're trying stuff on at Cabela's, and you know, but I tried so I tried those on, and you know, it just had the the men's, and they were kind of didn't exactly fit. So they had these Cabela's, and it was for women, and they're polar arctic, and they are just oh my gosh, I love them. Like, I keep trying to figure out a way how I could actually wear them under my work clothes when it gets really cold around here and not look weird. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, um, I like the base layers and the layer up. I, I love my scent lock suit. I have a, a cold weather one. So as far as, as clothing, that's, yeah, that's definitely the route we go. Gotcha. Touch a little bit about tree stands, then we'll get into Louisiana and what the terrain's about and what uh, what what the environments you guys are hunting in. But what what kind of tree stand? I'll start with you, Taylor. Uh, tree stand preference: hang on, climber, ground blind, ladder stand. What tell us what your your preference is? I'm more of a hang on guy myself. We've done some ground blind hunting here recently. We have a property. It's actually in Madison Parish, Louisiana, which is more like a northeast Louisiana towards the Mississippi River. And it's mostly CRP, so there's not a whole lot of trees to uh, hang hang on stand. Uh, so we've done a little ground blind hunting. If I have a preference, if I have a go-to, it would be hang on stands. And we actually, we like the advanced tree stands. We use those. They, man, they're they're incredible. They're um, super easy to hang, and they have this, it's, it's a really neat system. So instead of having to carry it up there, what we were, we actually found them. We were trying to find something that Crystal could could hang as well. She wants to be a part of, and she doesn't want just you know me doing everything for her. And you know she wants to learn how to do everything that, that I do, so that you know she can be independent. And uh, we were trying to find a stand that she could hang, and we came across advanced tree stands. And like I said, they have a super neat system where you actually just hang the stem, and then uh, you you lock in the platform, and then you lock in the seat. It's super easy to hang, and they're extremely safe. And like I was telling y'all before the show, we're super safety conscientious. You know, I've, I've had a family member fall out of a tree stand, and I also have had a friend that's fallen out of a tree stand. And, you know, so safety tops the list as far as tree stands go. And, you know, so, you know, that's that's the one that, that, that I prefer is the advanced hang-ons. So. Gotcha. Crystal, is that the same tree stand for you? Oh, yeah, Absolutely. It's so funny. Like I've I've watched him, you know, hang lock ons in the past and stuff, and I'm like, there's no way, there's no way, you know, you'd have to be like an acrobat or something to be able to hang this stand. And I just, you know, I had already just decided, like, there's no way I'm ever going to be able to do that. Like I realize that hunting is kind of a man's world, but you know, us women, like we're getting, we're getting on up there, we're getting in there. And uh, but I had already come to grips with like, okay, well, this is just one thing. Like, I'm going to have to have a guy to do. I'm going to have to have a man hang my stand like for the rest of my life because there's no way. So, you know, I started the more I've gotten into hunting and stuff, the more we started looking. And I was like, you know what? Forget that. Like, I want to I want to be able to from start to finish have my own hunt. Like, I don't want to have to, you know, even though he, he'll hang my stands all day long and he's great at it, I want to be able to contribute and to be able to to get out there and, you know, do just as well as the guys do. We were researching it and we found, you know, the advanced takedown tree stands and uh, went ahead and ordered one, got it in, and he was like, all right, let's see what you got. And I'm like, uh-oh. You know, I thought it was one of those, like, too big for my britches or, like, you know, open mouth, insert foot moments. And I'm just looking at this box. I'm like, okay, just act cool, act cool. So I take all the stuff out. And sure enough, like I, I'm whipping it together and we get out there and I'm I'm putting it up. And it, I mean, it's going smooth and easy. And I mean, it, that, that three-step system is just incredible. Like carried the, the stem up there, locked it on. It had a little bungee strap that went around that kind of held it in place so I could use both my other hands. So, And I was really worried about that. Like, how am I supposed to... You know, I'm not as comfortable in a tree as, say, he is who's grown up in, you know, in this industry. So, you know, for me to be up there fidgeting or fooling with anything, um, I was nervous. But, I mean, put the stem on, put in the platform, put in the seat. And, I mean, it, it really was that simple. So, they they definitely, they'll they'll have my business for the rest of my life. I love them. It made me be able to, like, work in a man's world, <laughs> you know, that aspect of it. 
So, yeah, lock on advanced takedown tree stands 100% in. Well, that's great to hear, you know, and that, that's something that uh, if we have female listeners out there that yeah. uh, been looking for a tree stand, it's always great information to be able to pass along to the female hunters and, and maybe yeah. be able to take their hunt to the next level. Tell us a little bit about uh, West Monroe as far as the terrain and, and where where uh, where do you guys hunt at? Is it big timber? Tell, tell us about the terrain. We actually have, um, well, it's actually three different places that we hunt mostly. We have... Uh, we have a place that is in Union Parish, and then we have another one that's in Madison Parish, which Union Parish would be more of just the north central Louisiana, and then like I talked earlier about the one in the northeast Louisiana, and then we actually do some public land hunting on uh, National Wildlife Refuge here, the Tinsall National Wildlife Refuge. As far as the terrain goes, it is flat and thick here in this part of Louisiana. Um, I've always said, um, and I truly believe this, that if you can consistently kill deer in north, northeast Louisiana, you can ki- kill deer anywhere because you walk out there and everything looks the same. There's no... Um, there's just, it's like I said, it's flat and it's thick and there's no, you have to do, it takes a lot of scouting and a lot of knowing what you're doing and you know, a lot of preparation to, to kill deer here. One of our leases, the one that's in, uh, in Union, you know, it's, it's more pines and it's, you know, it's just an old pine cutover and it's just regrowth pines. And, you know, we're in there and, um, you know, it's, it's, it's strange because we go from hunting over there and then we go over to uh, the northeast part of Louisiana and it's like a totally different world because we're going over there and um, it's CRP grass and we got the rut is uh, around Thanksgiving over there in the central part of North Louisiana and then we got the rut and you know towards Christmas and the northeast part so you know it's a lot of back and forth and it's a lot of uh, preparation and, and knowing what you're doing around here um, you know it's it's not easy. And, uh, you know, Louisiana is not, this part of Louisiana is not necessarily known for, you know, it's giant bucks, but the parish that we hunt, the two parishes we hunt in consistently uh, produce, you know, the most uh, amount of deer killed every year in the state. And, you know, they also produce some of the biggest, you know, we have had a really, really tough year this year. It's been one of the toughest we've ever had. Um, you know, like I was saying, you know, it's, it's not easy to kill deer in perfect conditions here. Um, and we've had far, far from perfect conditions this year. It's been extremely dry. We've had a, you know, a big time drought, which we actually got some rain the last two days, which hopefully is going to help a lot. And we've had one of the largest crops of acorns that we've ever had. So these deer, you know, like I said, it's a lot of it's, you know, big timber and, um, over there towards the northeast part and you know these deer don't have any reason to move they're laid up and you know they're they're feeding on these acorns and you know it's just it's making it's making life tough this year but uh, you know we obviously we we try to we think of ourselves as pretty good hunters and you know we're not uh just gonna sit back and just you know cough it up and say well you know tough hunting tough situations because you know that is part of the louisiana hunting that's part of louisiana weather it's just it's back and forth and you have to keep adapting and that's what we've been trying to do this year. And, um, we're going to continue to try to do that as the year goes on. Is there anything that you do in particular to make that change to, to suit the deer herd? Well, I, right now, before this rain, we were really just water. We were trying to get to water. I mean, our water and any kind of food, uh, we, like I was saying earlier, we, our, our drought has been, man, it's been, it's been epic. And we haven't, we had, like I said, I think we had, we had one rain, on labor day and then we had two days of rain yesterday and that's the first rain we've had in like two two months i believe two and a half months and um so there are no food plots you know it's extremely dry there's no water anywhere so you know what we've been trying to do is you know find water sources and uh find you know ample amounts of food and uh that seems to have have worked a little bit better but it's you know it's still been tough this year yeah it sounds like it yeah craziness Good deal. Jay, you want to get into a, a memorable hunt with them? Definitely. Yeah, I think it's time to go go on the actual hunt itself. Now, guys, I, before we started, I prepped you and I said, hey, let, let's think of a couple of memorable deer hunts that you've been on. And uh, I want to go with you on these hunts. And I don't know if it's the same hunt you were both on or you have individual hunts that were more memorable. Whatever they were, we want to hear it. And we want to hear it in detail. So, Taylor, let's start with you. Where are we going to go? 
We are going to go back to I was 12 years old Hmm. and my brother was eight and we were hunting here in our hometown of West Monroe, Louisiana. And um, I had taken a couple deer and had been hunting for a little while and uh, he decided that he wanted to hunt. And like I was telling you all earlier, I I love taking people hunting. I love taking youth hunting. you know, I've always enjoyed hunting with other people and getting to, you know, enjoyed watching other people, you know, take deer just as much as, as, as I have enjoyed taking deer myself. So I was taking him that morning. Uh, it was me and him, and we were sitting on a pike line uh, in a big box stand, and we had a lever action 30-30. And so we're sitting there, and it's it's really cold, and we're sitting there, and, um, you know, it's about an hour after daylight, and we haven't seen anything, and you know, we're doing what any 12 and eight year old are doing, you know, uh, passing time and joking around and laughing and probably making a lot of noise. And um, about that time, I looked to our right about 100 yards and there is a doe coming across the pipeline. Well, I pick up the gun for my brother and I handed it to him and um, you know, I pulled the, I, I remember cocking the lever and I remember that it was my heart was beating at that point faster than any any deer I had ever killed, and you know just just the thought of him actually getting to take his first deer and it be with me, and you know he cocked the lever and I covered my ears and he put his earmuffs on and he uh, he fired and I looked up and the deer hit the ground and you know we're celebrating and we're just having a just a just a great time and you know just just really just hooping and hollering and doing all that. About that time I look up and another deer stepping out. Well, as I th- what I thought was another doe, I was going to take the opportunity and, and kill one too, and we were going to share in the moment. And <laughs> crazy enough, it turned out it was a little bug, and it happened so fast that I had to shoot the deer. Um, and he still gives me a hard time, and my family gives me a hard time about it today. They're like, well, you know, it's really great that Chandler killed his first deer with you, but it sure would have been nice if you'd have let him kill the buck and not the doe. So. <laughs> 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 but... You know, we had, we had a great time, man. You know, that's, that hunt is probably the most memorable one ever. You know, I got to kill, you know, I got to kill a deer with, with, with my brother. And, you know, we got a, we had a big picture. We blew up me and him sitting there together with it. And, you know, like I was telling you all earlier, my, I have two brothers and my other brother also killed his first deer ever with me. And, um, you know, I've, I've, I've had the privilege of being with quite a few people that have taken their first deer and, uh, you know, that's a, that's a super neat feeling. So that's awesome. Oh, that's a great story. Very, very cool. Uh, Crystal, how about you? Where are we going to go with your deer hunt? Well, um, considering that I don't have as many as Taylor does, um, under his belt. Um, I don't know. I think, I think my, the one that stands out to most, you know, the most to me was probably my first, um, my first bow hunt kill. Okay. It was two years ago. Was it a year ago or two years? No, I guess two years ago. Um, and we had just started hunting um, this new lease in Jonesboro. Um, and, you know, I was, I was so proud of myself because, like, I could walk into my own stand. And, like, I didn't, you know, he didn't have to tell me where to go or walk me in anymore, make sure I got off up the tree safe or anything like that. Like, I, you know, it was one of those, like, I'm, I'm a big girl moment, I guess. You know, I could pack my own hunting bag and I could, you know, walk, you know, walk myself into the stand, get up the tree on my own, get down from the tree on my own, all that good stuff. So all was right in the the hunting world. And um, I'm sitting up there and, you know, it's it was a hard hunt. It was, you know, I, I don't think I had seen a single deer in about six hunts before this. Um, so I'm sitting up there, you know, and in my head, I'm, I'm already like doubting. I'm like, oh, I'm not going to see anything this time either, you know, but, you know, I, I really enjoyed sitting out there listening to these squirrels, you know, sound, sound like they had at least eight points coming off their head, moving all around me. Um, and I, w- I was sitting there, I was sitting there and all of a sudden, you know, I, I, I somehow managed to make out the, the, the deer walking through the woods from the squirrels ruffling around. And I just knew, and I, I remember like slowly standing up and you know, how your heart races, you know, and, and, and just that excitement. And, and I watch him walk in and, um, I eat for a little while and, and hang out and, and I go to pull back. And when we just kind of back up for a second, this wasn't the first time I attempted to kill a deer with my bow. This was just the first time it happened. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. Before. That's usually <laughs> the way me, it works. Yep. 
Yeah, let, let me just preface it with that, um, you know, because I got so excited the time before the second that I, I saw hair, you know, in, in the peep. It was like, ah, yay, go. No, just kidding. Straight over the back. Never even touched it. Right. Um, right. So this time, you know, like Taylor said earlier, learn from your mistakes. So I sit there and, and she goes, she finally just goes broadside and I'm just, uh, I'm trying to keep my composure, but I'm just, you know, inside just jumping up and down like a screaming little five-year-old. Um, at Christmas morning and I draw back and I make sure to, you know, concentrate on my breathing and I'm, I'm remembering, okay, when you see hair in your peak, don't shoot, wait, you know, get, get it on the right spot. So, um, you know, and I can hear Taylor's voice in my head make sure to do this and put your hand here and do this and look at this. And, uh, you know, I wait and I, I get the perfect shot and I let go and I'm, I'm watching that lighted knot just just fly down straight through shot she you know how they jump up and she runs yep. off and I'm trying to pay attention and watch where she's running but I'm so excited that I'm not even thinking either um and it was just the coolest moment ever and I don't I, I didn't even gain my composure and I, I'm sitting there and I'm texting Taylor because he's in you know in another tree stand um about a mile or so down the road and so I'm, I'm texting like oh my god send I can't believe it Send. I just killed one. Send. So he's sitting in the other deer stand, and his phone is just like blowing vibrating yeah. out of his pocket. <laughs> She's blowing up my phone. So, yeah, right. And he always says now he's like, you know, he'll he'll text me or something. He's like, God, I can't wait for my my phone to be blowing up soon. You know, right. like he always knows when I get one because his phone will go off and then it'll go off and off and off and off. <laughs> nice. But that was just the coolest moment. And then, you know, even even like the 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 chase of it, like the tracking the deer, you know, that was uh, the first time getting to track my own deer. That was so cool. And, you know, just following it in. And like when we finally found it, like learning how to, to follow the blood and like he let me track her myself. So, you know, he just kind of stayed in the background and let me let me do it. So I'd be so excited. You know, I'm going from, from one spot to the next spot and, you know, you lose it for just a second. And then the excitement when you find it again, you know, and, and, and following it. And then that moment where you go around the corner and you go through that thick, that thick pine and you see that big white belly laying there. And it's just like the, the, the heavens part and the angels sing down moment. It's like, Oh, <laughs> Right. Um, it was just, it was amazing. And like getting to experience that with him, you know, was just super cool in itself. Um, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't so fun when, when we lo got lost trying to come out of there and he's dragging, you know, cause of course he drug it for me. I did, I did allow him to drag my deer. <laughs> oh, that was nice. So yeah. Nice. Good job. Yeah. He's he yeah, he's he's dragging the deer out and, and apparently I was supposed to be following the blood trail that we came in on out, but he I guess I was walking slower, I couldn't find the next spot we were supposed to go, so he just like went around me, like huffed and puffed and went around me. And so I just thought he knew where he's going, so I start following him and all of a sudden he's like, All right, so where did it where'd the blood go next? And I'm like, Uh I was I was supposed to be following the blood <laughs> 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 and so we get lost. That's funny. Oh, memories. That, memories. That's a good one. That's a good memory right you there. You know? Yep. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. Well, excellent. Well, thank you for sharing that with us. I have 10 rapid fire questions, and I want to see if you're ready for them. I didn't prep you, as I had mentioned before, but I think what oh, I'll gosh. do is I'll go back and forth and I'll let you answer each of the, the 10 uh, as we okay. go. So you guys ready for this? We're ready. Okay. All right. Ready. Let's start with Crystal. Crystal, what's your number one hunting tip of all time? Uh, number one hunting tip of all time. Make sure that you're scent free when you go into the woods. Uh, you don't want a deer blowing you. That sucks horribly when you sit there and then they spot you and they blow at you. Gotcha. Taylor? Uh, the same exact thing. Just play the wind <laughs> all the time. Uh, you know, even with the scent control products, it's always important to play the wind. Right. And, you know, I've found that, you know, no matter what I do or um, anything else, if there's absolutely one thing that I have to do on my hunt, it would be to play the correct wind. So, Gotcha. Very cool. All right. Yeah, we'll start with Taylor on this one. We all have these things that we consider maybe good luck charms or maybe they actually do make your hunt better or you perform better somehow. And it drives you crazy if you leave it at, in the truck or at home and you don't have it with you. Other than your gun or your weapon, what's that one thing for you? 
toilet paper, and I'm just going to leave it right there at that. Beautiful. All right. <laughs> Crystal? There you go. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I don't, uh, like I said, like I, I really like hunting with um, with Taylor's grandfather's hat. It, okay. it, you know, kind of, it seems to have brought me luck. Like I'm normally, I've, now that I think about it, I've, 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 I've been wearing that hat every, every deer that I've taken with my bow. Well, there you go. Oh, wow. Okay. So it does make me hunt better and it is lucky. Boom. Okay. Yep. Well, there's your hat. thing. You lucky have hat. your, you have yep. your one thing right I have there. A thing. That's it. That's my thing. All right. Crystal, what's your biggest pet peeve in life? Oh my gosh. Biggest pet peeve. We're just going to do one. Yes, just, just one. one. You're only no, allowed one. Only allowed um, one tonight. <laughs> God, I've got like 50. No, just kidding. Um, the biggest pet peeve in life. Um, anybody thinking that uh, they're more special than anybody else. Like I, I like to treat people with the same kind of respect um, that I've taught my eight-year-old to treat everybody else with. Like if um, if you see somebody being bullied, you know, don't jump on the bandwagon and, and bully to be cool. Like be the cool kid that stands up for the other guy, you know, and I feel the same way in hunting, you know, just because, just because I haven't, you know, my buck's not as big as yours or I don't have, you know, it's fancy of a whatever, like it's not about what you have or, or what you do. Like as long as it's, it's ethical and you're doing the next right thing, like be proud of that and stand up for, for who you are and stand up for others too. So pet peeve would definitely be uh bullies. Gotcha. Okay. Taylor. Hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. I, uh, yeah, just people that are hypocrites or, you know, say one thing and do another, uh, it, it, it drives me crazy. And whether that's in everyday life or, you know, the hunting world or, you know, no matter what it might be. Gotcha. All right. Very good. All right. Taylor, how old are you today? I am 28 years old. You're 28. What would you tell the 16 year old Taylor Hans, knowing what you know today? Oh goodness! Uh, don't do it. No. Uh, <laughs> no, I would just tell him to just listen to what your parents told you. Uh, all those times that you thought that they were stupid and that the stuff that they were telling you would never come true, or um, you know that that life wasn't really going to be as as difficult or as stressful as everybody made it out to be. Um, I would I would go back and say. You know, you were wrong and they were right. Gotcha. All right. Crystal, what would you tell um, you? How old are you today? How young are you today? I'm, I'm a cougar, remember? I know I'm that. Really I want old. to find out like how 90. much. You're like 90. Okay. <laughs> um, I am 32. 32. All right. So it's not, that, it's not that much difference. No. Uh, you guys must have met at homecoming. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, I'm just kidding. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, well, let's, uh, so let's go to 16. Crystal, what would you tell the 16-year-old Crystal Mahoney, knowing what you know today? Oh, my gosh. I would say, Crystal Mahoney, go out and buy yourself a bow. You will be happier if you were in the woods. I knew nothing. (laughs) Seriously, I knew nothing about hunting. I knew nothing about, you know, drawing back a bow. I I didn't know anything about it. And I probably would have been hanging out with a lot cooler people had I known that at 16. So, Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah, good good answer. Get out and hunt. Very good answer. All right, Crystal, you are at a hunting convention somewhere in the world, and a stranger is talking to you, and they ask you what you do for a living. What do you tell them? It's funny you mention that because I will actually be at a hunting convention, my first one, soon we're going to the ATA show um, in January, so that this will happen. Um, I would tell them that uh, my career, I'm an outside sales rep for a local supply company called Office Links in Monroe, Louisiana. I absolutely love my job. Um, and, and as hobbies, I am a hunting enthusiast. So that would be a Very good cool. description, Very I cool. guess, of, of my, my career life. All right. Taylor? I would tell them that I am a outside salesman for Coca-Cola. I, uh, I work for Coke. I've been there for about three years now. And um, like I said, I, I have a, a, a three uh, city territory that I cover and I, uh, I sell Coca-Colas for a living. Very cool. All right, Taylor, what did you have for breakfast this morning? I actually do not eat breakfast, Jay, so I had nothing. You I had know, nothing. I know it's supposed to be the most important bre- meal of the day, but I am just not a breakfast person. All right, fair enough. Crystal, what did you have for breakfast? I had two cups of coffee, mm-hmm. <laughs> and I had a uh, deer jerky. <laughs> no kidding. 
All right. Yeah, I swear to God. Actually, yeah, listen, here, here. That's, that's the bag. That's the bag. That is the deer jerky <laughs> still, bag. Yeah. That, that is the infamous right yeah. deer, deer, deer jerky <laughs> bag, if I've ever heard it. All right. Very yes, good. and it's from the it's from my, the deer that I killed earlier this year. That's so excellent. We just got it back and got the jerky, so I'm I'm pretty obsessed with deer jerky. Yeah, that's good stuff. I love deer jerky. Yeah. Okay, mm-hmm. Crystal, you get your own billboard. It's a blank canvas. It's on the side of a highway. It can say anything you want it to say. What would you What would you put on that billboard? Um, that's a good one. Uh, quality time with family. Okay. Uh, it would It would probably have a picture of you know, of us in the kitchen frying up some deer meat and, um, you know, like Taylor's dad and stepmom and brothers and, um, Braxton, you know, sitting underneath the table, petting the cat and sitting there laughing and talking while I'm in the kitchen, you know, frying up deer meat or, um, rolling up some, some bacon wrapped deer fillets to, to throw on the grill. Something, something to do with spending time with family. Very cool. All right, Taylor, what would, what would yours say oh man i've been battling between two different ones but i'd probably go with can't we all just get along i just <laughs> the old classic nice that's right yeah. that's what i would that's what it would be yeah very cool all right taylor if i say the word successful to you who's the first person that pops into your head and why it would be my fiance crystal um i kind of alluded to it a little bit earlier kind of when we met um but you know just as in lots of different people, you know, they go through, you know, trials and tribulations in their life. And, you know, when I met Crystal, she was, um, she was waiting tables and like, there's absolutely nothing wrong with people that wait tables. That's, you know, a lot of people do extremely well, uh, waiting tables, but you know, she wasn't happy is what I was trying to get at. She wasn't happy doing what she was doing. Um, you know, she had had to move back in with, you know, with her mom and uh, through some extenuating circumstances and, um, you know, she just wasn't real happy with where her life was. And, you know, she took it upon herself to change that and, and to do something different with her life. And, you know, I've got to see her, um, you know, would, she is the definition of successful and, you know, self-successful. She, um, she's self-made. I mean, she truly, she decided she wanted to do something and she did. And, she, you know, she went out and um, she took the route, you know, she's, like she said, she's in outside sales and, you know, she took the route that she took today and or that she has today and um you know i think it was i think it was i think she's literally i'm not exaggerating i want to say she's almost like 20, it's about 25 times what it was when she uh took it over and uh you know she's just done extremely well for herself not only just in her professional career but you know she's an extremely wonderful mother and you know what i've seen her how i've seen her grow in the hunting world um you know, like like she was saying earlier, and I'm sure the you know the viewers and y'all have seen like she's very independent and she wants to be able to do things, you know, on her own, and she doesn't want just want me out there, you know, doing everything for her. like every time we go do something, you know, she wants to know why she wants to know why we're putting stands where we are. She wants to learn, you know, what she's shooting, what you know, what her equipment is, you know, why just just the questions that you know everybody that is successful, you know, ask, and uh, you know, it's just it's been neat to you know, do the personal, you know, just be with her and, you know, as well as, you know, have a hunting partner. You know, I've uh, always wanted, you know, my dad and my and my stepmother, they, they hunt together. And, you know, I always thought that that was super neat. And couples that hunted together, you know, I thought was just always was super neat. And, you know, I get to have that now. And, you know, we have a really, really good time doing it. And, uh, you know, we, like I said, we just have a lot of fun. Very cool. Crystal, who, who would you say is your most successful person? Oh, that was sweet, Taylor. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, I would have to say when I hear the word successful, like I, I think of, I think in, of Taylor, and I don't know if that sounds like narcissistic or anything like that. Just, I guess it's just because I know like the intimate struggles that you know he and I have been through and and have had, and like where we come from and where we're at um, in life now. And like you said, like when when he and I met, like I had I had just gone through a divorce and. I was trying to get back on my feet and my mom was kind enough to let me live in her laundry room. Um, it might not sound like much to, to most people, but you know, I was extremely thankful for that little, you know, I don't even know if it was 10 by 10 room. Um, right. you know, but I, I managed to, to stay there and, um, save up enough to buy my own house. 
you know, I, I, I saved up enough for the down payment, you know, and went to the bank and, you know, luckily I got, had good credit. So I was able to purchase my own home and, you know, went from, you know, I was a, a college graduate living in mom's laundry room, waiting tables. You know, I had a career before that and everything. And I'm just like, how'd I get here? And so, uh, met him and, and with, with some encouragement and with us, you know, working together and finding ourselves again, like, able to to buy the house and and get the career and and transform it into what it what it's become today um and and be very successful and just grow you know like I said like watch him be able to grow as as a stepfather and a role role model for my son and like you know us give each other encouragement and motivation not just to wake up and be the same people that we were yesterday but to to continue to strive and to be better people and to grow and not just live the the normal lives that you know it's like okay oh wake up go to a job I hate go oh I guess I have to cook dinner tonight like we don't we don't live a life like that like we're we're thankful for the things that we have and we get up and we're, we're excited to go to these jobs because we like them, you know, like, um, one of our leases actually, like we lease, you know, we're in a lease with Taylor's boss. Like he loves his boss. Like who gets to say they love their boss and like are good (laughs) friends with their boss, you know, like that doesn't happen. Um, but like we're, we're in a hunting lease with his boss and like, I'm super excited to meet his wife because he's really cool and I like him. And so like, I bet his wife's really cool. And like, we could all hunt and hang out together. So that's been neat, you know, and the company that I work for, like, they're like family to me. I mean, it's, it's a small locally owned and operated company, but they're really good to me. And like, they believed in me when, when nobody else would give me a shot. Like I said, I was waiting tables. I mean, they gave me a shot and like, we've, we've, you know, we both never regretted it and, and haven't looked back. So we're really fortunate to be able to do what we love, not only in our careers, but also, you know, um, at this hunting thing, like, you know, I'm new to this and it's always been his dream to be in the hunting industry. And this year things have really taken off for us. So the definition of successful, I think is what we've been able to accomplish this last year. You know, the, the work that we're doing um, with some different companies, like we get to go to the ATA show and um, that's huge in itself. Like, uh, you know, three years ago, I didn't even know what that meant or what that was. So just to, just to have a full, happy, you know, happy, successful in in our eyes and, you know, whoever else, I don't know what anyone else's definition of success is, but to wake up in the morning and to love the person that you're with and to love the life that you have and to be, you know, excited about coming home to cook dinner for these people and to be excited about what I'm cooking them, you know, I'm, I'm cooking them a deer I killed. How cool is that? Right. Um, or what's even cooler is, is when I'm cooking a deer that my son killed, you know, that's, right. that's the coolest part. Right. Like that's, that's when I really get excited, you know, that's when I invite the whole neighborhood and start screaming like, Hey, Bob, Bobby, you want to come down the road? Yeah. We're picking up Braxton's <laughs> deer tonight, you know? Right. That's Funny, awesome. you, you laugh literally. I've had that conversation. <laughs> like, uh, I don't doubt you. I don't. I don't doubt that at all. It sounds fantastic. Yeah, it's just yeah. that's that's successful. That I I feel like I feel like the life that that I've I've gotten to have with Taylor is is my definition of success for Great. sure. Very nice. All right, Crystal. What's a day in the life of Crystal Mahoney look like? Well, obviously, you know that I wake up and drink two cups of coffee and eat deer jerky. Yes. So um, that's how my day starts. Uh, it normally starts to get up about 530, start the coffee pot. Um, we have a weenie dog named Steve. Um, yes, his name is Steve. Um, my son named him. <laughs> Steve is a lot better than Runny which was his first choice. And then we have, um, we have a, a husky wolf mix um, that likes to talk our head off. She's a mess. She sheds everywhere. Um, and so I normally get up with them and they watch me make the coffee and I love on them while I'm making my coffee. And then I get the kiddo up and ready for school. Um, if it's my day to do it, Taylor and I kind of alternate days. Like sometimes he'll let me sleep past five thirty, and he'll get up and get Braxton ready and take him to school. Um, so get him to school, I get to work, I uh, normally do computer work uh, for a little while, do emails with customers and get my day sorted out on what I need to do. And then I go out and see clients. Um, some days I get to actually eat lunch outside of my vehicle. Some days I am eating deer jerky for lunch inside my vehicle, like today. 
um, when I have a lot of clients to see and stuff to do. Uh, then I go get the kiddo from daycare, um, come home, we do homework. Uh, I normally am cooking dinner, whatever it is that I'm going to cook. Taylor gets home, uh, kiddo takes a bath, I normally read a book or something, hang out, talk, watch TV, put him to bed. And then Taylor and I normally sit in the the dining room and brainstorm on, you know, where should we hang this in? What what new products are out there? Well, what, what, you know, we normally have our, our normal hunting conversation or we'll talk about um, whitetail widow makers or, um, you know, talk about, uh, do like a, a demo video. Like we, we have the whitetail widow maker site. And so we like to, to try out new products and we'll, we'll make a video, you know, talking about, whatever product it is, like, did it work for us? How did we like it? You know, like we did one, um, you know, I fell in love with the advanced takedown tree stands, like Mm -hmm. that I, as a girl could actually put them up. So we do videos like that talking about, okay, well, you know, are you going to hunt the boot? Are you going to hunt this or that? We'll kind of get our hunting strategies together. And then, uh, and then it's off to bed. Very cool. I think it was that uh, video of you and the the takedown tree stand that caught my eye. That's that's how I ended up contacting you in the first place. Actually, is the way you had done the video. Yeah. It, it was very, it, it was professionally done, uh, but it wasn't over the top. And I, I sometimes always feel like there's this you know, a pitch, like or a something. script yeah, or something. A script. Yeah, you're just yeah, kind of yeah. going at it, mm-hmm. but you were clear no. and descript, and it was it was it was refreshing. Like what well, people, everybody needs to do videos like this. Why don't I see more of this stuff? <laughs> You know, <laughs> right? Right. So because normally they're trying to like sell it to you, and I was just, yeah. I was just excited. I just want to see I, how the I, thing I'm works. Yeah, just show me how it's set up. That's all I want to know. I don't really want to. I mean, if I like it, I'll buy it. But if I just just show me how it works, that's it. That's all I want to know. Exactly. Right, well, Taylor. Yeah. What's your what's a what's your day look like? Oh well, I nothing real extravagant or special. I've I guess I've gotten uh, pretty boring in my older age. I. uh I guess it's a lot very similar to hers. Like I said, we, we, we alternate uh, days that we get up with her son and, you know, take him to school and um, we alternate on days that we pick him up. So if it's, if it's my day to, to, to take him and pick him up, you know, I'm waking up with him and I'm getting him ready and I'm, I'm getting him some breakfast while I don't eat any breakfast. And uh, <laughs> I, uh, you know, get him off to school and then, um, you know, I'm, I'm headed to work. I, I actually, um, I live in, in Monroe, but my actual territory with Coca-Cola is uh, um, I have a – my closest town is 20 miles and my farthest is 60, so I work a little ways away. Um, so you know, I'm headed out to my first account, and um, I'm going into these accounts, and I'm, I'm ordering them Coca-Cola, and I'm making sure that everything's neat and clean and um, set up the way that it needs to be set up and just trying to make my customers happy and uh, you know see if I can't strike up a – conversation about hunting somewhere throughout the day um i try to make try to make as many of those as i can um and then as the day winds down i'm i'm uh, coming home and i'm either picking him up from school and bringing him home or i'm i'm coming to the house to uh see them and uh like she said we we do our family time and then we have our you know our time with me and her we talk about you know our our whitetail widowmakers page or you know we talk about what we need to do next or you know who you know, just, just like she said, just brainstorming, you know, we're not only in life, but also in hunting, we're very methodical and very, you know, we try to plan everything out that we can and have everything to give us the best opportunity to be successful. Um, just like she said, we sit down and we, we talk about things and figure out the best plan of action. And, um, if it's a weekend day, um, you can almost guarantee if it's not raining or there's not something super pressing going on i'm waking up and i'm in a tree stand that morning and i'm in a tree stand that evening i try to hunt we try to hunt every single possible day that we that we have the opportunity to okay all right that that leads me into the last question it sounds like you alluded to it a little bit what's a deer hunting Ah. day in the life look like ah i'm sorry jay uh (laughs) a deer hunting day looks like this i we wake up um Usually, um, I'm on time and I'm waiting on her to hurry up and get ready. (laughs) (laughs) We're we're getting out the door. Uh, we like to, like I said, we're very, we like to give ourselves the best opportunity to be successful. So, you know, we get, we like to get in the stand, you know, at least an hour before day, uh, before daylight and, uh, 
know, we climb up the tree and uh, sit there and I guess just hope that, you know, that day turns out to be a successful day. We're checking the wind, we're checking the pressure, um, you know, all those different things, you know, just trail cam pictures. We're trying to pattern these deer, trying to figure out what they've been doing, why they've been doing it. Um, just all those things that go into trying to make yourself as successful as you possibly can deer hunting. Um, and then, you know, if, if we are successful, we're, um, taking it to our, you know, taking it home and, um, or taking it to the local processor, whichever one, and, uh, you know, skinning it out and, and, and going from there. And, uh, you know, it's crazy deer hunting is you put all in all this work and, um, all this thought and so methodical, like I was saying, and it's crazy. You, you almost have to, I played baseball as a kid and, uh, you almost have to have that baseball mentality about this deal because I put all this preparation, all this work, um, and if I end up, if I'm successful three out of 10 times, I'm going to the hall of fame. And, uh, but in the other, you know, the other seven out of 10 times, I'm going to be, I'm going to be unsuccessful. And that's just kind of the way that, you know, deer hunting works. And you have to be, you have to be mentally prepared for that. And you have to, you know, prepare yourself that you are going to be unsuccessful more than you are going to be successful, but you have to you know, learn from those unsuccessful trips and make them better. So, right. Gotcha. And Crystal, would you concur? Is that, is that the deer hunting day in your life as well? Yeah. Yeah. That definitely sounds, sounds about right. He's normally, you know, ready and, and waiting and I'm, you know, still trying to make sure that I have everything because I didn't do it the night before. Like he said that I should. And then I'm laying on the couch. I'm like, eh, it'll be fine. I'll get it in the morning. And then he's waiting and um, I'm not ready. Uh, but no, that, that sounds about right. We normally, like to get out there early so we can we can hear the woods waking up. I I don't necessarily think the whole hour before is necessary, but he does, so we go with it. You know, he knows more than I do. I would I would <laughs> prefer more of like a thirty minute sit in the dark thing. Um, but yeah, that that sounds that sounds like a day in the life of. Gotcha. Yeah. Very cool. So that's the ten rapid fire questions, guys. You did very well, and thank you for going through that. We learned a lot about you and. Crystal and Taylor, tell me more about Whitetail Widowmakers, why you started it, and where the listeners can find more information about you guys online. Like, where are you Where are you hanging out? Yeah, um, we actually started Whitetail Widowmakers. It's, you know, Taylor, since he's a little boy, has always dreamed of being in the hunting industry and, um, you know, lives his life around hunting and thinks about it all the time. And, you know, that it's become my way of life, too. And we were sitting there one day and we were scrolling through Facebook and we noticed that, you know, a lot of people were, were kind of making excuses for their, their trophies, their deer, like, you know, prefacing it with like, oh, I know he's not the biggest or, you know, this may not be the, the, the best buck ever, but, you know, and we were just like, well, that's kind of ridiculous. Like you shouldn't, you shouldn't have to apologize for, for the hard work that you've put into your harvest and, or make excuses for, you know, your definition of a trophy. If, if you, um, harvested that deer ethically and legally, um, be proud of it. Don't, don't apologize for that. So we, uh, we just started talking and we were like, you know, we need to have a place where like hunters can be proud of what they've done and put in their work and have a place where, where you can talk about like what you're using in the field to make you successful. You know, it's so funny because when I first got into hunting, you know, I would ask people like, Oh, what do you, what do you use or what do you do or what do you shoot? And like, or what kind of deer are you seeing? Or, you know, all these questions and Taylor would like stop me sometimes. He's like, you don't ask that. Or, you know, you don't, people don't talk about that. Like as if it was like a hush hush secret, like you didn't want another hunter to be as successful as you or have as big of deer as you or something like that. And I was like, well, that's crazy. And he was like, you know, I think it's crazy too, but that's just what it is. And I was like, well, why don't we try to change that? Like, why can't there be a place that we can talk about like how, how we are getting bigger deer or, or like what we're doing to improve our hunts or what we're using that seem to make us more successful. So, you know, based on, on all those thoughts and, and stuff, um, we started Whitetail Widowmakers and um, it started off as, 
is like a just a, a Facebook thing, and um, we talk about the products that we use. Um, you know, like I was talking about the tree stand and um, how I absolutely love the advanced takedown tree stands um, because me as a girl, I can I can use them. So on on our uh, Facebook site, we'll do like product reviews of it, and you know, we'll talk about a product that we found and and what we like about it or what we we don't or anything like that. So um, and then we we celebrate you know people's trophies whatever that definition is on there and we just kind of come together uh we just kind of come together as as a hunting community and celebrate each other um we actually too like just partnered up with um louisiana bow hunters um those guys are great we became contributors um for their site and they have the same you know the same ideals and the same beliefs that that we do which is you know unity and and we need to support each other in this bow hunting community like we're all in this together so that's kind of how we came up with the concept um of whitetail widow makers and you know our hearts and our 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 lives are are dedicated to it you know just just being more successful and helping those around us and and especially you know us as louisiana and a whole successful so um it's really great we love it uh we spend every waking second that we're not at work or you know hanging out with the kiddo talking about it or thinking about it or, or coming up with ideas um you know to do for it but it's it's been a fun journey Oh, and how you would get in touch with us. Um, there's three different ways to contact us. Okay. You can check us out on Facebook. Mm-hmm. Um, it's at Whitetail Widowmakers 3. Okay. So um, you can search us and find us there on Facebook. You can also, we have a Twitter account. You can find us on there. It's at capital WT underscore widow underscore makers. Okay. Um, and then we also have an Instagram. You can um, check us out on there. It's whitetail underscore widow underscore makers. Perfect. So those would be the, the best three ways to uh, contact us. The three, us. the three main social media platforms. Gotcha. Yep. yep. Very cool. Very cool. Uh, Dusty, do you have any final questions for Taylor or Crystal? No, I don't, Jay. I think we pretty much cover everything. And yeah. Very, very great. nice. Uh, Taylor and Crystal, it's been a pleasure having you on the show. We've learned a lot about your life in Louisiana and how you met and uh, yeah, all the deer hunting strategies you go through and what it's kind of like to hunt down there. And thank you for opening up and sharing your, your life with us. Thanks, thanks for, for having us. us. Yeah. Yeah, we, uh, we, I've, you know, we've, we listen to y'all show, you know, quite regularly and y'all have some pretty famous and big name people. And, you know, we, uh, we, we just appreciate the opportunity to be on y'all show. Cause you know, like we created that page and, um, you know, we just, we're just everyday folks, man. We're just everyday people trying to, you know, we work a 40 hour a week job and, you know, we hunt every chance we get and, you know, we, you know, we're just everyday people and, you know, we really appreciate the opportunity to come on your show as everyday folks and, and talk to y'all and uh, thank y'all for having us. I, I appreciate that. And, you know, I think we're all everyday folk and that's the way we like to keep it here on the Big Buck Registry. And that's what the way we're always going to do it. Everybody deserves to be one of the one of the crowd out here, uh, just getting out there and getting it done in the deer woods. So. Oh, thanks to Crystal and Taylor for joining us on the Big Buck Registry Deer Hunting Podcast and telling us what it's like to hunt deer down in Monroe, Louisiana, where the, the land of the Duck Dynasty. It's kind of interesting. Definitely a different style down there, Jay. You know that that southern southern hunting, and uh, you know I'm sure it's uh, unique in its own way. We have some other friends down there, and you know, it seems like we make friends all over the country every week in some way, shape, or form. And people who just uh, never never dreamed we'd know or hang out with. Them. Here we are, three years, four years later, and uh, I bet we could hunt with a friend all over the country at this point. Oh, absolutely. You know, just uh, very blessed to, to be able to have them connections, Jay. And, uh, you know, it's uh, amazing the, the folks that we've run across or been involved with or uh, been introduced to. It's just very unique. And, you know, you got to say thanks to everybody that tunes in with us week after week. It, it's just amazing uh, that you enjoy us that much and enjoy our guests that... Uh, you join us week after week and hit the download button and, and the play button. And if there's uh, somebody that you know would like to be on the program and they've got one heck of a story, you know, send it into us. We, we'd love to talk to talk to, to everybody, not just uh, somebody that's killed a huge monster buck. That's that's not what this show is all about. 
you know, obviously a, a huge monster buck's always nice to hear a story, but that that average guy, that blue collar guy that's hunting, that's uh, no different than Jay or myself. Uh, we like to talk to them too, just because they they always got that one or two different techniques that maybe we haven't heard of before, and right. it just might change your whole season. Right, or or maybe they teach you that we're overthinking this stuff. Maybe we're doing too much, and this is just. Maybe they don't. They do a whole lot less with a whole lot more success. You just don't know until we get them on the air. And you know, we'll if you keep hunting hard, we'll keep working hard to bring you the best guests that we can and people that you've heard of, people you've never heard of. Just but the the common theme there is they're, they're all great hunters, no matter who they are, and they will appear on this show. Dusty, do we have a Chubby Tines tip of the week this week? Yeah, Jay, absolutely, you know, and I'm digging kind of deep into my magic bag on what I do late season. And uh, The Chubby Tines Tip of the Week is sponsored by Morse's Sporting Goods. Firearms, use firearms, bows, use bows. Located at 85 Kentucky Falls Road in Hillsborough, New Hampshire. Give Jim a call at 603-464-3444, morse'ssportinggoods.com. Your dollars go further in New Hampshire. There's no sales tax. Morse's Sporting Goods. You know, obviously the snow is starting to fly in most areas. And down south, you're not going to see that snow. But uh, just something for the snow folks that uh, are hunters. You know, maybe, maybe you've stayed out of your woods all year and, and you haven't uh, went in and seen what's going on. That that snow is a, a, a great educator. Uh, you know, it, it allows you to see where deer movement is without actually getting deep into the movement areas. Right. Uh, I like to go in with a good good pair of optics and uh, kind of scroll, get into the woods and, and, and work the outskirts, maybe get a couple hundred yards into the woods and kind of work my way around a little bit and see where different trails are. And, you know, this snow is going to educate you where that, that major corridor, highway, whatever you want to call it, it's, it's going to allow you to be able to get a visual on that uh, without uh, leaving a huge scent trail, good pair of rubber boots or a uh, good pair of snow boots that are, you know, try to be as scent free as possible. And, and you, you make that venture in there and, and check out where they're traveling. And, and you might be able to see a bedding area with a good pair of optics, like up on a ridge or on the hillside, or, you know, just be, be gentle with it. Be careful. You can move around as long as the snow's not too frozen and crusty. You can get in there and move around and, and be pretty, pretty much silent in the snow, fresh snow, especially. But uh, use it as your advantage and get in there and, and try to see what's going on. And maybe you have to make a few adjustments over to a different hillside where you see the activity of the deer. If the deer are eating acorns in the woods right now, they're going to absolutely be tore up like a hog's been in there, rolling around and snorting and rooting. Uh, just, you know, take time and, and figure out where the deer movement is and how do you need to adjust for late season. That's a great tip. and It's, it's I can't say how important it is. Now, we've got, like, some, some snow in New Hampshire, a good six inches of the, the white fluffy powder, and how revealing that snow is to the actual corridors that these deer are using. It is like a, a, a template. It's like you just made a template for where these deer are moving. It's undeniable. It's unmistakable. You cannot mistake it for anything else. You can learn a ton about not only what deer are in your area, but what other game are moving through and sp- specifically what tree, for example, they like to hug around with on their trails. You know, they, right. It's unbelievable how revealing this stuff is right now. If you're not out there in the next two weeks as the snow's flying, you've missed a very important piece of what next year will be. So, yeah, it's definitely it's it's a definitely an educational device. The snow is, and and a lot, a lot of times where where I see a mistake made is, is these deer will actually around here we got a lot of cedars and, and there's pine thickets where you're at, Jay. When that snowstorm's coming in, these deer in Ohio. They get up underneath these cedar thickets, yep. and, and they, they make a bed, and it's an obvious bed, and you're going to be able to, to pick it out. As soon as you see it, you'll know exactly what it is. Now, keep this in mind that sometimes in cedar thickets where you see that bed, when that, when that storm comes in, they go into them thick cedars. That may not be their bedding area. That may just be that really thick, safe zone for that storm cover, and then they're going to branch back out to where they normally would hang out. So you that snow is going to be able to allow you to see the activity from the cedars to a, to another thicket or possibly a bedding area. Or you just got to be able to visually see. You know, usually when a snowstorm comes in, there's one track leading out of the cedar thickets here. 
Now, once you get beyond that cedar thicket, then it's time to see where, where them tracks are, are going in and out, in and out, in and out. That's when you get educated. Right. You know, right. when they walk, they walk away from the, the, the one, one time bedding area for the storm to come in. That's where they hung out where the storm hit. And then they get back to their normal pattern and go to their bedding area. They're going to educate you. They're going to let you know which way they're headed. You could look at their feet tracks in the snow. It's going to tell you a whole lot about what's going on in your woods. Right, right. And you can do this in the woods. You can do this from out of the woods. You can do this in your car. Yep. Uh, you know, you can learn a lot for a very short amount of time. I bet I found 12 new hunting spots that I never even dawned or never dawned on me that these, these would be good deer hunting spots just today, just, just driving yeah, around. A- yeah, it's, it's, it's really is amazing that uh, with the snow, there's there's a spot where I would have never dreamed that there was such a major right. road crossing right. for the whitetail here by the house. And man, when once I figured that out, th- there's got to be 20, 30 deer crossing this thing because it, it literally is, is 12 foot wide and burn up. I mean, it looks yep. like you went through there and put salt down where these deer are crossing. And yep. I, I had no clue right. till you know, four or five years ago, I was driving down the road. And I'm like, why is that all burn up for right there? And I seen it one day, and next day I slowed down. I said, "Oh my goodness, yeah. those are all deer tracks." Yep, it's crazy. It's crossing back and forth. It is. It's amazing what the what the snow will educate you with. It will is the, some of the best education you'll get. And some of those spots that you you find, you, yeah, you kind of thought that was the case, but this is the confirmation that you needed. So, oh yeah, don't waste any more time. If it's snowing where you are, get out there. And if the snow's not too deep where they're starting to yard up and they're still kind of in their, their natural moving patterns, now's the time because it's a very small window before they yeah. go to yard and from where they are coming off their natural patterns. You could, you could take a, a, a drive. Like say, let's say you're, you're hunting one particular place. That's all you got uh, permission or access to and, and drive a mile in each direction down that road or around the block. It's going to tell you where them deer are going, coming, have been, where they're not, you know. There's all kinds of places that you drive down the road and you say, man, I bet there's a lot of deer in there. Well, the snow will educate you if there are deer are crossing the road or moving around. or Yeah. You, know, you, you can look out in the field and see, especially, I, I think, I think uh, you know, open fields and, and deer, it's just amazing how you can get a good pair of binoculars out there and glass across that field, and you can see tracks everywhere. If, if there's a lot of deer there, they're going to they're going to sh- tell you yep. and visually show you that they're there. Yeah, you'll find them just with binoculars. It's that good. It's that good. So, a uh, great tip, man. Love it, love it. And thanks to Morris's Sporting Goods for sponsoring the Chubby Tines Tip of the Week. And I also want to say thank you, as always, to the Scentlock Enforcer and to the Eurohanger for sponsoring the Big Buck Registry Deer Hunting Podcast. It's been absolutely mind-blowing experience once again it's always a great pleasure to work with you dusty a great pleasure to work with jim and work with our sponsors on this show Uh, it is the holiday season we will be back next week on the 24th of december and uh, we'll we'll have another show for you even and even though it's the day before christmas we will have one out no question about it so dusty where can we find you this time of year when you're not hanging out here in big buck studios you can, uh, sometimes you can find me in the whitetail woods of Ohio, Jay, but I ain't going to tell you where that's at. But uh, <laughs> look me up on Facebook, uh, Dusty Phillips or Chubby Tines Outdoors. You can shoot me an email, dusty at bigbuckracery.com or Instagram at Chasing Antler. Shoot me a follow and uh, I try to get everybody involved and, and uh, touch bases with, uh, with everybody that joins in on that. But uh, it's a pretty un- unique experience on Instagram and being able to follow some of the listeners and it's just a just a connection and, and making friends. Jay, where can people reach out to you when you're not on the mic? Uh, best place is to shoot me an email, Jay at bigbuckregistry.com. Uh, if you'd like to follow this show and listen to it on multiple different types of avenues, different channels, different ways, uh, different devices, there are all kinds of ways to do it. If you're on an iPhone, for example, you just go to the podcast app. We're in there. Big Buck Registry. Just type that in. You'll find us. Stitcher iHeartRadio, Blueberry, we're on YouTube. Just type in Big Buck Registry. In fact, if you go to Google, just type in Big Buck Registry, you'll find us. We'll be on the first, I don't know, 10 pages at least of Google because we're pretty much everywhere podcasts are and we're on every social media platform you can imagine. 
Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. It's always bigbuckregistry.com forward slash whatever the social media is. So bigbuckregistry.com forward slash Facebook or facebook.com forward slash bigbuckregistry. Twitter, same theme. Instagram, same thing. YouTube, we are now producing our show as a video on YouTube each and every week, no matter how long or short the show is. Um, A lot of people do use YouTube as just a general search engine. You know, a, a, a place to listen to music, for example. They're showing music videos on YouTube. For ex- um, They're showing music videos on YouTube, but people will go there just to listen to the music. Well, kind of the same thing. We have our video of our audio on YouTube, and people can go there to listen to our show. So that's kind of a unique feature. But I think that's pretty much everywhere we're at. Again, if you'd like to help our cause to the Safety Harness Project, just uh Shoot us an email, Jay or Jim or Dusty at BigBuckRegistry.com. If you'd like to become a patron of the show, go to BigBuckRegistry.com forward slash donate. And all the information will be right there for you about how to donate to this cause and help us make this show better and reach more people. I think that's about it, Dusty. It's a whole lot of big buck, Jay. It certainly is. We'll we'll be back next week. Can't wait. But right now we've got to go. I'm Jay Scott. And I'm Dusty Phillips. This is the Big Buck Registry Deer Hunting Podcast. See you next week. Can't wait.